Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining. My name is James Callender, and I'm the Director of Business Solutions Australia New Zealand for Workplace Options. I am passionate about changing the mental health narrative more broadly, and I work with organisations to integrate mental fitness within their employee journey. To begin, on behalf of Workplace Options, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I am joining you from Eora Nation of the Gadigal people whose oral history has been passed down over tens of thousands of years through stories. A lesson that I am learning from the traditional custodians of our land is the importance of storytelling and its ability to connect, influence and inform us. A story that we all feature in is the mental health of humanity. Now, whilst this may seem blue sky, within our respective remits, we can each be a positive influence in the lives of the people around us. Employers have a particularly unique role to play as their employees spend on average one third of their adult life at work. And in fact, recent reports suggest that this time we spend at work is trending up. As hybrid work blur the lines of work and home, domestic responsibilities are being reshuffled and financial stressors delay retirement. As I pay respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today, I want you to remember two things. One, that mental health is a journey, and two, that we each have our own story. Now to the topic of today, addressing psychosocial hazard laws in Australia and preparing for the shift from education to enforcement of these laws by WorkSafe agencies. 2011 saw the introduction of the model Work Health Safety Act by Safe Work Australia, a Commonwealth framework that promotes maintaining a safe workplace as everyone's responsibility. In 2022, Safe Work Australia released a new code of practice for managing psychosocial hazards at work. These are approved guidelines of practice for any person conducting a business or undertaking, or PCBU if you've been reading literature. The states of Australia have the power to bring these guidelines into action, and since late 22, the states have slowly been doing so, including New South Wales, where I'm dialing in from today. The guidelines require organisations, officers, including directors and managers and duty holders to appropriately identify, assess, control and review control measures for psychosocial hazards in the workplace. To meet their duties, to ensure health and safety, psychosocial risks must be eliminated or minimised so far as practicable. Harm caused by psychosocial hazards can include anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome and sleep disorders. Now, before I steal any more thunder from our panel of experts, please let me introduce them. Renee Kasparian, Senior Associate at Henry Williams Lawyers. Renee is an experienced employment lawyer, having worked in private practice for almost 10 years and exclusively in the employment law space. Renee advises and assists clients on a range of general employment, industrial relations and work health and safety matters across a variety of different industries, including retail, hospitality, manufacturing, building and construction and professional services. When it comes to assisting clients, Renee supports the HR functions of the business through the employment lifestyle, life cycle rather, adopting a practical and commercial approach to achieve viable outcomes for clients. This includes advising and assisting clients on work health and safety matters, including undertaking WHS reviews and audits conducting staff training, assisting with inspections and investigations by WHS regulators, and working with clients to develop preventative strategies and systems to minimise WHS risks. Oliver Breck, Managing Director and Psychologist based here in Sydney for Workplace Options. Oliver completed his Bachelor of Psychology with Honours at the University of South Australia before returning to Sydney and completing his Masters of Professional Psychology at the University of Wollongong. Oliver has worked on major cultural enhancement, team development and leadership development initiatives with a number of high profile organisations and individuals across Australia. And finally, Mary Ellen Gornick, Global Employee Assistance Effectiveness Expert and Work Life Innovator 
consultant workplace options. Mary Ellen is an internationally recognised expert with nearly 30 years of experience in designing and delivering workplace effectiveness and employee benefits programs. She leads the WPO consulting practice, advising global clients from a wide range of industries, including energy, pharma, tech, finance, media, retail, and logistics on strategic wellbeing initiatives that create environments where workers thrive emotionally. Today, to ensure that we have an effective learning experience, we encourage your input through our question panel on the right-hand side, as well as responding to our live polls, which will pop up on your screen. So let's begin. Renee, in your words, what nuances exist in the recent legislative changes that pose the biggest challenges to businesses operating in Australia? Thanks, James. And also just wanted to say a thank you for the introduction. Um, with this question, I think the starting point with it is to bear in mind that with these changes that are coming about, this is not necessarily a new legal duty for employers. So as it currently stands under the work health and safety laws, employers already do have an existing legal duty to ensure so far as reasonably practicable, the physical and psychological health and safety of employees. So James, you helpfully briefly summarised the, the legal framework that we're working within. Um, but to give you an idea, there's a bit of a hierarchy behind it. So we have sitting at the top, the Work Health and Safety Act. Um, and under that, there is a primary duty of care for employers in relation to the health and safety of their employees. And what's important to note is that health actually includes psychological health. So there has been a duty from the outset when these laws were int introduced for employers to take reasonably practicable steps to manage the psychological health um, of their employees and, and other workers. What we're seeing now though, or, or the changes that have now come about is there is a, now a focus on the psychological health of employees. So what happens is what falls under the Work Health and Safety Act is then Work Health and Safety Regulations. And then we also have codes of practice. So where we're seeing the changes occur is in the Work Health and Safety Regulations and the codes of practice. Now these are still um, legislative instruments. And so there is still a duty on employers to comply with Work Health and Safety Regulations. So if there is a breach or a contravention, then penalties may be um, applied enforcement action may also be taken by regulators. So this is why it's important that employers are aware of the changes and what this means about psychosocial hazards and risks and how to manage them. So what are those changes? The regulations now actually have a definition for psychosocial hazard and they also have a definition for psychosocial risk. So a psychosocial hazard is a hazard which arises from or relates to the design or management of work, the work environment, plant at the workplace, workplace interactions or behaviours and may cause psychological harm. Then psychosocial risk is a risk to the health or safety of a worker or other person arising from a psychosocial hazard. So we now have these concepts um, which have been focused on through mental health and raising awareness about psychosocial and psychological health actually being defined in the regulations. So they now have definitions. What this then leads to is that there is then an express obligation in the regulations on um, employers or, or person conducting a, a business or undertaking to manage those psychosocial risks. So where there is a psychosocial risks identified in the workplace, there's an express duty to, to manage this. And, and the regulations also set out how risks are meant to be to be managed. Um, and what that is is in a nutshell, it's a risk management process. And that's broken down into four components, which is to assess the risks, um, sorry, identify hazards, assess the risk, implement control measures, and then review those control measures. So that's what we are seeing now then is that express duty now for PCBUs or 
employers for ease um, to actually actively manage the risks or psychosocial risks in the workplace. So there's now this express duty um, to actually do this. And there is now also an express duty to put in control measures. Um, so employers now do need to show that control measures have been implemented in response to any, any psychosocial risks that have by, been identified in the workplace. Um, and that comes about through your risk assessment process. Now, what this means for businesses or, or some of the nuances that I think will occur with this um, is that businesses will need to be aware that it's not just a, a sort of tick the box exercise or a tick and flick check. There will be a focus on businesses being able to show that they have proactively taken steps to assess psychosocial risks and implement control measures accordingly. Um, this will need to be demonstrated. It, it will need to be shown that these um, steps have been taken. And on top of that, that the measures implemented are being reviewed and being reviewed and monitored regularly. So that if adjustments need to be made or also if there's any new risks or hazards identified, that those are also being addressed. A few other nuances I think that businesses will need to think about um, in terms of the, these new, or not a new duty, but I guess more refined duty now with psychosocial risks, um, is that a business will also need to consider all issues that may be contributing to psychosocial risks or issues that workers might be having. Um, so it's not going to be as simple as identifying just one simple issue or putting things down to one issue or one isolated incident. Um, it will need to be looked about or these risks will need to be looked at as a as a whole rather than just on their own. Um, and this comes back to, I mean, generally as a premise with work health and safety, hazards don't occur alone, um, but generally there'll they'll be quite a number of them working together, particularly when we are looking at psychosocial hazards. Um, usually it is not just one issue, it can be a whole range of issues or a systemic issue within an organisation. And so businesses do need to be aware of that. They do need to be mindful that they need to be looking at um, issues more as a whole or holistically rather than individually as well. I think another nuance um, that we will see with this is that the duty or um, the duty, I guess, for an employer or for businesses is that they do need to ensure the health and safety of workers um, from acts or omissions that could pose a risk to their health and, and safety. And this also extends to third parties. Uh, so a, a business does need to be aware um, and assess where a third party and, and their actions may potentially pose a risk to the health and safety of their workers. Um, particularly when it comes to psychosocial um, risk, this, this is going to be an important one because careful thought needs to be given as to how you may be able to implement um, appropriate control measures given the limited ability of um, businesses to exercise control, I guess, over third parties. So a, a very good example of, of how this may play out, um, if you take retail, for example, a psychosocial risk um, to em employees who work in retail shops could be um, poor treatment um, or abuse by customers. Now, customers are a third party and it's obviously quite difficult to control their behaviour. Um, but it, it is a risk for the people working in those industries that they may be exposed to um, harassment or abusive behaviours from customers. And so businesses working in the retail industry are going to have to think about what uh, control measures they can put in place to minimise the psychosocial risk of that type of customer behaviour on their workers. So this is, I think that's going to be a, a big nuance or a very important nuance. Um, in the regulations and, and working through psychosocial risks. Um, the other nuance that I can see potentially occurring with these changes as well um, is that businesses will need to bear in mind that psychosocial hazards or psychosocial risks can vary um, in the workplace. So it might not be that um, one psychosocial risk is a risk for the whole workplace or for all workers, but these things can be different. Um, 
So again, if we take, say, the manufacturing industry, for example, there's obviously very different groups of workers that are in that space. A psychosocial risk for office workers is going to be different perhaps to a psychosocial risk for those working in the factory on the floor. And so businesses will need to be aware or very conscious to make sure that their risk assessment um, is tailored or works for the varying degrees of the business. Um, it can't be a one size fits all approach. Uh, proper measures will need to be taken to make sure that uh, groups of workers or different types of work are appropriately assessed. Um, and this also means that different control measures may also need to be used across the business as well. And that also leads into one other thing that I will say on, on this topic or, or the nuances for businesses is that with the risk assessment process that you do use for your psychosocial hazards, um, as well as the fact that hazards and risks may differ um, um, within the business. This also means that the frequency or the, the time periods in which you actually review um, and go through your risk assessment process may also need to um, vary or may need to change. Uh, part of your risk assessment process is that the frequency and the duration um, of those needs to be appropriate for, for the identified risk or hazard. You do need to review and monitor um, and how frequently and how often you do need to do this will be dependent on the risk as well. Um, what should also be borne in mind here is that um, exposure to certain psychosocial hazards or risks as well can also change. And so your review processes may need to align with that. So you may have workers who are exposed to a particular hazard um, or a particular risk for a very short period of time. Others may be exposed for a longer period of time. And that's why you'll also need to make sure that you do keep on top of those review and monitoring processes. Fantastic. Thank you, Renee. Now, I know that there are also some penalties uh, that can be applied to PCBU who aren't uh, meeting their obligations. Can you share, I guess, the area of law where these, uh, where this Act sits or where these regulations sit and therefore what penalties could be uh, imposed? Correct. There's definitely penalties that can be imposed. Um, what I will say is that in terms of penalties and fines, so just generally speaking, um, if there is a breach or a contravention of work health and safety laws or work health and safety regulations, penalties you're looking at usually a fine, though for some contraventions, individuals may also look at a term of imprisonment. So that is a possibility. Um, depending, what it depends on is the nature of the breach. So what what actual um, breach has occurred, what section of the Act are we talking about, what regulation are we talking about. Um, as well as that though, um, it will also depend on sort of what state you're in because the amount or the, the, the time or term of imprisonment can vary as well from state to state. Um, the other factor will also be the severity of the offence which will play out. So if the offence is say just um, you know, it's just a reckless um, misdemeanor almost. Obviously, a fine that applies is is less serious. But when you're going towards the higher end of the, the spectrum, if it is a serious breach or it's an intentional, willful breach of, of regulations or legislation, then more serious penalties can apply. And okay. yeah, I, I will clarify, it is both the Work Health and Safety Act and the Work Health and Safety Regulations where you can be penalised if there is a breach. There you go, something for people conducting businesses or undertakings for, to certainly be aware of. Um, and we might do a quick pulse check here before we move on to Oliver. Uh, now a question will pop up on your screen, which is have you taken any steps to managing psychosocial risks in your organisation? Uh, there is 88 of us uh, on this webinar at the moment. So if we can take the time, there'll be a few moments for you to submit your answer. Uh, we can certainly uh, follow this train of thought either uh, back through from a legislative perspective with Renee um, or from a uh, clinical and consulting perspective with Oliver and Mary Ellen.
Interesting. So that's good. 75% are taking active steps. So certainly if you do have any questions that are specific to your situation and the steps that you have taken, please pop them in the question panel uh, and I can direct those uh, to one of our experts. But Oliver, let, let's move on. So from Renee educating us on the legislative scene and giving us some background there and the penalties that um, a person conducting a business or undertaking can face. Uh, popular terms that uh, Renee referenced is certainly psychological safety. Can you please inform us how psychological safety and psychosocial hazards are related and how they differ? I'm particularly interested uh, if one is more important than the other. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Renee, for your comments so far as well. It's uh, always really interesting to start looking in at the legalities of everything and just how um, complex uh, it is but how, and how thorough we need to be as employers and PCBUs. James, yeah, to that question, I mean, we, we were looking to unpack this internally within the organisation over the last couple of days and looking at just explaining psychological safety versus psychosocial safety, uh, looking at them directly against each other becomes quite a mess and quite confusing very quickly. We even found ourselves tying ourselves in knots, trying to pull them apart um, directly. The way really in order to do this uh, best is to first probably just unpack every single definition that there is in this space and look at them each uh, separately and then how they work together and combine. So I think the first thing to realise from a clinical point of view uh, and, a, and, a, and a consulting or psychological point of view is that the ability for humans to work provides um, some terrific outcomes in addition to financial reward, right? So you look at po positive psychology theory and, and what we, we believe and understand has been those innate necessities for humans to engage in and feel in order to live a resilient and thriving lifestyle and work ticks a number of those boxes. So for a number of examples, work provides us an opportunity to connect, provides us to be a part of something that's bigger than just ourselves to provide meaning and engagement. It also helps us to uh, an opportunity to make a difference. Again, ticking that box of meaning and finally it also gives us the opportunity to achieve. Right, so a lot of us work uh, seeking to achieve uh, something, whether that be the financial uh, reward, whether it be to make a meaningful difference in the world, or whether it be to um, change something as well, or 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 succeed at creating something. So, work provides these terrific positives, but of course, at the same time, it can expose us to certain hazards uh, along the way as well there's opportunity to fail we're interacting with others and as we know humans don't always play nicely in the sandpit so there's a lot of different uh positive and negatives that come from working so from those two factors combining every single organization has a state of psychological safety in what it in how it operates and for those who have or have not started this journey in unpacking their psychological hazard and risk profile as an organization it's important to know that no matter whether you do or do not buy into this concept, do or do not address it, your organisation is always going to have an element of psychological safety, which is what is the chance of your people experiencing those benefits of work versus getting injured at work? And no organisation, I believe, no organisation in the world sets out with the intention of hurting their own people. Every organisation would like to think that their workplace is a safe place to work. But, so that's psychological safety. The reality of work though hits in that every job and the nature of what we do in our jobs presents the opportunity to be exposed to certain psychosocial hazards. And they are just an innate part of doing what your organisation does, the innate parts of humans interacting with humans, the innate part of just us behaving and those those hazards as Renee pointed to come around in the concept of sort of job design as well so uh, is the workload that we're assigning to our people manageable uh, is it stable uh, is it something that they're trained and experienced at doing there is also the concept of the work environment uh, Renee mentioned retail before as well and work environment for retail places might include aggressive behavior dissatisfied customers etc if we're in a manufacturing concept, then the plant and machinery we use can be a hazard as well. And then finally, the way our employers, the way we as humans interact can also be potentially 
a hazard. And these are just innate. There's just opportunities for these to arise in whatever you do. And they're gonna be more prevalent, less prevalent, depending on your industry. And to a certain extent, the way your organization is put together. How your organization then, I suppose, uh, has designed itself or has uh, prepared for these hazards will give it, uh, will mean that certain of these hazards prefer, uh, present then as the risks that are present within your organization and your people can be exposed to. So a hazard can be somewhat innate to industry or the nature of your organization put together. The risks are supposed of the results of how well you have attempted to manage or pure luck if you haven't taken any steps to manage those hazards or address those hazards that are part of your industry and workplace. Those risks and how well you've attempted to mitigate them and or manage them will then result in the real psychosocial safety of your workplace. So the ideal is utopic, it is nothing uh, present that uh, can impact your people. They will only ever experience the positive components of work. But of course, once you include the reality of hazards and then what your organization done has done to mitigate or not mitigate them, you will end up in the current state of psychosocial safety of your workplace. So there we've addressed psychosocial safety, psychosocial hazards, psychosocial risks. The crux of the question was how does psychosocial safety and psychological safety interplay? The key to this is then, uh, now that we've unpacked psychosocial, is to unpack psychological safety. And that is that psychological safety really doesn't have any direct uh, linkage to mental health. Psychological safety is the safety for your people to do the key components of being a human and operating within a workplace. That is the safety to learn, the safety to bring my true self and whole self to the workplace, the safety to contribute, and the safety to constructively challenge the norms of your organization. The way we do things, um, the way we address certain problems, the way we take an input and create an output. If your employees feel safe in those four areas, you will have a high level of psychological safety. So strictly within this concept of psychosocial hazards, that sits within the hazard that is your employee interactions. So if you have low psychological safety, that is your people are berating each other for mistakes, are teasing, bullying, harassing each other, then your psychological safety uh, rating level within your organization is a psychosocial hazard. If it is really high, your people respond well to mistakes, we try to teach, we try to educate, we allow people the opportunity to learn, we encourage people to interact and bring their true selves to work, then your state of psychological safety will actually become a protective factor in the face of those psychosocial hazards. They're two separate things linked in into that one area of what a psychosocial hazard is and therefore can be a component of your psychological risk profile, psychosocial risk profile, sorry, of your organization. Without overcomplicating it, the things that organizations, the thing that organizations do need to uh, recognize is that this level of psychological safety within your organization will help you combat and mitigate the other psychosocial risks that are present within your workplace. If your people feel safe to learn about their roles, to learn on the job, to learn new roles, it will help eliminate some of this, or manage, sorry, not eliminate, manage some of the psychosocial risks present within your workplace. If your people feel uh, that it is okay to use their voice to challenge and speak up when they recognize the risks or realize the risks in your workplace, it will help you to address them before they become an injury and before that real element of liability, speaking a little bit out of my lane there, Renee, become uh, a reality for your organization. So they're just as important to each other uh, as each other. As you set out your journey for those 25% of you that have not begun this process, I would encourage you to sit down and first reflect about what the psychological safety is of your organization before you attempt to identify, assess, manage, and then review. Because it is going to impact the way and your ability to accurately identify and assess when you go to your people and ask them, what are the risks you feel? 
how do you feel protected at work? How do you feel vulnerable at work? If they don't feel safe to speak up, you're not going to get true realistic answers and you're going to be left still vulnerable. It'll then also help once you're in the journey in the review page, uh, review phase, the final component as well there, because it'll encourage your people and allow them to have the voice to come and speak up when they feel it is necessary. Of course, doing it in a constructive manner as well. So I hope that's unpacked it for everyone a little bit. We went all the way back to its most basic form and separated them into their three different concepts. But by doing that, I hope it helped you realize it's the psychosocial safety of your organization is the state. How realistic, how, what is the balance between your individuals likely to be having a good day and achieving the benefits of work versus being hurt at work? Psychosocial hazards are the innate part of industries and organisations that expose people to those potential um, downfalls of work. The risks are what was relevant to your workplace based on how you've designed your work and mitigated those risks. And that results in the realistic psychosocial safety or the real level of psychosocial safety in your workplace. Psychological safety sits within the way your people interact, but has a role to play across that whole journey for you. So make sure you're paying attention to both, but you're being really careful to articulate and reflect on them as two separate uh, factors, components and situations of your workplace. Thank you, Oliver. And I think it's uh, it's a lesson for some of us to take away, which is the time is now to take it out of the too hard basket as the regulators are moving from education through to enforcement. Oliver, reflecting on your clinical experience, what mental health injuries are you seeing present clinically and are there particular industries at greater risk? Mm. So this is a really interesting one, given how prevalent the concept of workplace stress and the concept of burnout have been over the last two to three years of organisations, they in themselves are not considered injuries. They are in themselves considered symptoms uh, or signs of potential injury within people. The main um, injuries that we have been seeing within uh, individuals is in fact, so I'll make sure I get this absolutely right for you, is anxiety disorders. So uh, a nervousness, anxiousness around work or the interaction with others. And that can be because my concept of that is because anxiety can cover so many different areas. You can have social anxiety, you can have generalized anxiety, and of course you can have sort of phobias, et cetera, as well. In regards to, I suppose, the most common psychosocial risks we see, currently within the EAP sphere is around interactions with others. You look at the presentation data to EAPs, the majority of presentations over the last two to three years have been related, when you look at workplace reasonings for, for present, presenting, has been due to interactions with colleagues, harassment, bullying, et cetera. So when you're talking about psychological safety, the way your people are interacting, that's gonna be a pretty, good starting point for you to start your investigations as well. In regards to indus industries, we know, you know, your first responders, military, etc. exposure to trauma is an innate part of doing those uh, roles, those jobs and for those organisations. However, the hotel and hospitality industry actually had, does present uh, with a large range of, um, oh, sorry, a high number of psychological injuries. I think looking at some recent data from 2021 to 2022 by the ABS that uh, hospitality, hotels and, and, and hospitality, sorry, accounted for 5.6% of all psychological industry uh, injuries uh, experienced at work. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ellen, I'm pivoting across to you now, as Oliver has just unpacked the journey towards the realistic psychosocial safety of organisations. What process have you seen an organisation use to identify psychosocial hazards internationally? Uh, and are there certain factors that affect psychological safety at work? Well, um, thanks, James. I think the, uh, the area that really affects psychological safety at work 
is the overall organizational culture. So the, um, the factors around psychological, um, psychosocial risks and psychological safety um, need to be viewed within the context of the culture of the organization. So what we see is that um, over the past, I would say maybe two years since we've been coming out of the pandemic and we've seen the increase of um, concerns around mental health issues rise in the workplace, um, we're looking at organizations are looking much, much closer at um, the psychosocial risk factors that exist within the organization. And some of the ways that we've seen them begin to do the identification of that um, are start starting out by leveraging some of the existing data that they have from their ongoing engagement um, assessments, uh, studies, or their um, pulse surveys that they do, um, or just generally organizing um, psychosocial uh, well being risk assessments that are mainly focused on work conditions um, and how individuals are able to perform their work. Um, so in terms of some of the organizations that we've been um, looking at and working with, they're really looking for those instances of excessive workload um, with schedules um, that don't let up, um, that they're not just um, temporary um, overwork, overtime schedules, but they're consistent. Uh, situations where individuals are working well over 40 hours a week. Um, organizations where there may be sort of lack of role clarity or there's insufficient either tools to do their work or insufficient resources. And the other area that has really um, been highlighted recently is the lack of information relating to business sustainability. So the fact that um, many organizations are seeing um, increased competition, um, economic downturns, workers have a real sense of, will I be able to stay employed in this, um, in this organization? And that creates an enormous amount of stress around their financial futures. Um, and so this is one area um, that we've been seeing quite a bit um, of attention played to this because organizations don't always communicate around this um, one area, but it is a source of increased stress and anxiety. And then the other area that um, Oliver mentioned again is how the organization tolerates transgressive behavior. So the bullying, the harassment, um, the worker conflict, workplace violence, all of those situations play a role in terms of individuals feeling safe. So um, the number one thing in terms of managing psychosocial risks um, around identifying those risks um, uh, we're seeing um, a, a very, very high interest and um, increasing um, efforts in this area. And then secondly, for organizations that um, haven't developed um, comprehensive well-being strategies, there's a real move to align um, the well-being strategy to their business goals. We're even seeing some organizations that have very clear um, priorities placed around well being um, at the corporate level really begin to look deep in the organization to say, is this message cascading down to the management staff who um, are really in charge of carrying out our business objectives? So that um, developing that well being strategy 
um, and um, communicating it within the organization and then looking at how it's being delivered on an individual um, operational unit level. And so to that end, we're seeing more and more effort and attention being paid to focusing on the individuals who are the people managers in organizations and looking at what are what is their skill at identifying and understanding psychosocial risks and um, working to um, manage them within the workplace um, on a daily basis. Um, and then I think finally, what we're seeing is for organizations that have a, a global footprint um, beyond just developing um, a well being strategy, they're looking at how to build a framework, how to build a framework that covers all of the organizations, uh, all of the locations that they operate in to ensure that the well being strategy is relevant to that location. Um, to our point today that it addresses um, any of the laws um, in the countries in which they operate. So um, this is a, a very um, comprehensive uh, law in Australia. There are other, we also have, see countries such as France and, and Belgium, uh, Mexico, um, Japan, China, we're seeing that really increase uh, organ, the government of those organs of those countries taking a look at this important aspect of um, psychological safety um, in the workplace. So um, building that global framework is a way to um, make sure that the the strategy that's developed at the corporate level, trickles down into those local areas and and is is relevant to those um, to those locations. I think the other thing in the um, global framework is we're seeing more and more organizations create um, strategies strategies about ongoing listening. So the, a consistent listening strategy, so that employees' voices are heard. And this goes along um, you know, with, with what Oliver was talking about in terms of the psychological safety, you know, the, the ability to learn, um, to challenge, and to contribute to your organization. And you find out uh, about the temperature that, um, actually happens in the organization. Like what is the appetite for listening to those types of um, uh, messages that employees are communicating on an ongoing basis? So if you've got you know um, a real emphasis on quality, but you've got individuals on a production line that don't raise their hand when there's a real quality issue or a safety issue, um, then, then you've got a problem in the organization and then it's going to just um, snowball into um, an area that will create a, a psychosocial risk. So those are some of the um, things that we're seeing on a global level. And I think what's really encouraging is the fact that um, all over the world, we're seeing organizations begin to pay attention to this. Whether there are laws in place, laws provide a good framework and a model for them to walk through. But um, where there aren't laws, they're beginning to understand the importance of this dynamic within the organization and begin to put in um, um, systems in place to be able to identify and manage those risks. Great, thank you, Mary Ellen. And I, and Renee, I just wanted to draw a parallel here between Mary Ellen's observation for challenges in management communicating their wellbeing strategy down the line. Can you please share how everyone plays a role in the work health and safety of a workplace and that it's not just the responsibility of management? 
Yes, certainly, James. I think that is a very good point. So, I mean, here in Australia, I think one thing that tends to be uh, overlooked or sort of forgotten about in a way is that when it comes to work health and safety, uh, everyone plays a part, everyone has a duty. So that's from not just management, but we are talking directors and officers of a business. They have specific duties to the work health and safety legislation. Um, when it comes to work health and safety, you then do have um, people in management and your senior management team as well. Um, they can be captured by the definition of officer as well. So they can have those express duties um, placed on them. And, and those duties mean that they do need to take um, proactive steps, they do diligent steps um, to be across work health and safety matters and ensure that a proper system is in place um, to manage work health and safety risks. Um, but as well as that, workers themselves, um, and that's workers throughout the business, whether you are senior management, middle management, or a worker on the ground, you also have a duty, uh, an express duty in the legislation, legislation to take reasonable care for your health and safety and those around you as well. Uh, so everybody does have a part to play. Um, everyone does have a responsibility. And so yes, management um, do have a role to make sure that is also communicated uh, to workers at all levels. And I think what that follows into as well, it's there's an importance there on training too. Um, businesses should make sure that they have good training processes in place um, for all levels of the business to make sure that workers are aware of and understand their work health and safety obligations. It certainly is a shift um, socially and culturally away from thinking about safety as purely physical. Uh, and now incorporating the mental. And we are certainly on a mental health journey as well, thinking about our health and well-being is not just our physical health, but thinking about the mental health. Um, attendees, I do encourage you to put some questions in the panel, but I do have one for Oliver. Um, Oliver, Mary Ellen lifted the lid on culture, uh, being an integral component mm -hmm. of safety and culture, I guess is up there with a the buzzword uh, for many organisations at the moment. Can you please help us understand how important employee voice is in us feeling a sense of belonging and therefore contributing and helping our organisations identify these risks and hazards? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very, very, very big question there as well. But uh, if you want to link, really link your people to your organisation and get them to buy in uh, and really uh, commit to the organization, commit to the environment of the organization and commit to what the organization stands for, you need to in order you need to create a pathway for their voice to be heard so that they're able to see their uh, efforts make a difference. If you're that's one of the keys to motivating people is is does my is my effort going to make a difference? Uh, and do I feel that difference is important? Important. So it's really important for organisations to be reflecting on that and understanding or, or reviewing how how much of a voice their people have or feel they have. And there's some psychometrics you can use to directly um, assess the upward and downward communication that your people experience and whether they feel it's effective or not. And that leads into the final part of my answer here, which is as well that you know, it's important for managers and business leaders to not just reflect on what they perceive the state or flow of the voice to be, but actually to be ensuring that you're going um, uh, down to the floor to make sure you're actually asking the people what they feel their voice is worth. Do they feel it's been listed? Do they feel they have the correct opportunities uh, to raise it? And accounting for some of the, the nuances that they might feel they need in order to feel safe about their voice. Do you need to create a confidential path for people to raise concerns? Do you need to hold forums? Do you need to be creating one-on-ones? That'll all depend on your organisation, the culture of your organisation and the psychological safety of your organisation as well. So there's no one size fit all, fits all but it's a, an area of business that, uh, area of business and culture that your organisation has to be reviewing consistently as well. Thank you. And for the participants uh, that are with us, a key takeaway is that we want you to feel comfortable in this process, that it's not so big and scary and that it's okay 
to take it out of the too hard basket. And to help you on that journey, we might move to our next poll, which is which step of the four components of the risk management process are you least comfortable with? Uh, and then depending on the outcome of this poll, we will direct uh, the response to one of our expert panelists here to help you uh, establish more confidence in that step. Oh, 48% at controlling the risks. So Renee, I know that you mentioned early uh, in your presentation around the importance of um, looking out for these risks uh, and also continually reviewing them. And I know that review only got 10%, but one thing that really stuck out for me, Renee, in your presentation was that it's no longer a tick box, ex tick box exercise that we need to consistently do this because each day that we turn up to work, our environment may change. Uh, can you help us understand further some of the strategies around controlling risks and how we can make our participants feel more comfortable with that step? No, certainly. No, it's not surprising to me, James, that um, control is the one that people feel least comfortable about because I think and agree it is the the hardest one um, to to think about and it is the one that can um, vary quite a bit and it can change quite a bit. So so from a legal perspective, your the duty is that you need to um, put in place once you identify um, and assess risks, psychosocial risks, you then need to implement appropriate control measures to. Um, in the first instance, it should be that uh, to eliminate the risk, and if that is not reasonably practicable, then to minimise that risk. I do think that when we're talking in a psychosocial setting, though, um, the odds of being able to eliminate a risk are almost, you know, impossible, essentially. Um, so you are looking at that minimise um, aspect, I think, more so. Um, because we're not talking, uh, and this is the other difficulty there is with control measures for psychosocial, we aren't talking something as clear cut as a, a physical risk. Um, those can be quite easy to identify and then implement a control measure. If there is a trip hazard that you identify, quite simple, your control measure could be to remove the trip hazard or block the trip hazard, um, tick a box, on you go, move on. Psychosocial, different ball game that we're talking about can change, your risks and hazards can change all the time, your work environment changes all the time, who you work with changes all the time, your job, your position, your duties can also change. So I think when it does come to those control measures, remember what you need to do is first of all implement. So do your assessment, implement, okay? When you're implementing though, keep an eye on or be conscious of what are the risks you have identified, what are your measures and what do you think or how, you know try to foresee how might they change or how, how might they vary over time so that you can try as best as possible to look at when you might need to review because you do need to review and you do need to maintain your control measures as well so it could be and one of my you know recommendations usually would be set up at the very least a regular review date um, so that you know, despite changes or variants that may occur, you have a review date every six months. Um, if that's appropriate for the risk, it might be that it's every 12, it might be every three. Um, as well, identify persons responsible for those control measures and reviewing those control measures. That will also help um, to try and keep on top of it as well. And the other bit as, you know, being a lawyer here and we love these things, document it. Have a document as well that sets out what your control measures are in writing, when they're due for review, who's responsible. And that way, pe other people in your organisation can also pick it up, assist with it and help. Um, they might also be able to have input. The other bit that you might want to consider when it does come to these control measures and it forms part of your broader work health, health and safety duties in any event is, I think some of the best ways to try and get across control measures is consult with your organisation. Talk to your employees, talk to the managers, you know, team leaders, supervisors. What do they think would be an appropriate control measure? Um, 
no one says you have to run with the idea, but it could give you a good idea to move on with. So I think, and it, look, it is, you do need to consult your workers anyway on work health and safety. So you should consult on control measures and that could be a way as well to try and get some appropriate measures in place. And to Oliver's point, having a psychologically safe workplace really promotes that employee voice. Uh, and Renee, to reflect on one of your comments there around, there's a lot to do. Um, and certainly many hands can make light work. And if you have the engagement of your workforce, it can certainly help you on that journey. Now, Renee, you mentioned there around quite often, it's hard to eliminate the risks. Um, and if we were to draw, I guess, a bow back to the retail example, if we eliminated our customers, that may not be the best business decision. Um, you might not have a we, business. <laughs> no, but we do have a question here from our attendees. And it's how does an employer practically protect staff from a third party, both in or away from the workplace? Now, this is a construction example uh, whereby architects are on a construction site. It's not physical safety, but it is abuse from trades on site. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really good question and it is going to be one of those nuances, I think, with, with these changes um, as to how you do control or put in appropriate measures to deal with third parties. Um, it's going to be a difficult exercise, I think, for businesses to try and uh, manage these processes. But one of the things that I'm kind of thinking that employers could be looking to do is from the outset with your business relationships, you might want to exchange work and health and safety information um, with those that you're working with. So you might ask for a copy of their work health and safety policies. You might provide those. You might say, these are our expected standards of behaviour. These are our, our workplace behaviours that we abide by and we expect those that we're contracting with or those that we're working with to also um, engage in those behaviours with us as well. Uh, another thing that I think is key is also training your workers on how to how they can manage those processes um, or manage those situations as well. Providing with them with education and training on how they can manage um, those types of situations and giving them the tools to do it, I think, can go a long way as well. Um, and it might be that they need to have regular training on it too. Um, but I think if you can give them those tools to do that, that could also assist. The other um, measure I think might also assist is having in place proper um, procedures or, or complaints procedures, grievance policies, those types of things so that your employees know there's someone to go to with that issue. They know who they can report it to, who they can escalate it to, and then you have appropriate measures in place to actually handle those complaints. And that gives you the opportunity as well as an organisation to assess the complaint or the grievance or the issue and then determine an appropriate course of action. Because as you said, James, you don't necessarily want to close off your business or ruin business relationships, but at least if you can get the report or you can get the information, you can then at least try to act on it or put in an appropriate measure to try and um, address the issue. Thank you. And uh, while we're queuing the next poll, uh, there is some nice uh, synergies there between what Mary Ellen referenced, which is around having frameworks inside your organisation. And we're all in this together to improve the overall mental health, safety and wellbeing of our fellow humans. So knowledge necessarily isn't always power. Keeping it inside of our organisation may not necessarily be in the best interest of our employees. So if we can share that information more broadly, um, hopefully it makes it a little bit easier. So if we can have the next poll here as a parting note while I just include the closing sentiments, are you able to show the regulator that you have taken steps in response to the four components with respect to psychosocial risks. So thinking about elements like Renee mentioned, do you have it documented? Do you have frameworks in place? Because that is all something that you can help if the regulator does come knocking because they have moved from education through to enforcement. And we really wanna make sure that businesses are prepared and that they are not uh, caught off guard. So 58% of you have said that no, um, you haven't necessarily taken all the steps. And if we were to look at the glass half full there, that's fine because you're not the only one in the boat. Um, there's plenty of others in the boat there with you. And there are certainly services available for you during that journey to help you 
identify, assess, manage, uh, and review those elements. So the time is 1.59. I wanted to thank you for your time here today. Uh, if you do have any questions, there are our communication channels that are included in the handout uh, within this uh, webinar here. You will also receive a copy of the webinar, both the handout notes as well as a video link uh, if you wish to share it with any of your colleagues internally. Thank you and have a good day.